We're always able to lean into two different energies, which is a topic we've spoken about often here on the show. But when people say, oh, I want to get myself into a, a attracting power, I want to manifest more into my life, they often think that it's something that they need to do. Like I need to make a vision board, or I need to talk about it a lot, or I need to affirm how I want to feel, or I need to do, 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 I need to meditate more, I need to l read that book. When really the simplicity is that it's not so much about what we do, but it's about how we feel. Feel. When we feel good, we attract more good into our life. That is a core through line of this show, Dear Gabby. It comes up over and over and over again. For me, listen, I try to find even the most di difficult circumstances as an opportunity to lean into something that's a better feeling vibration. So sometimes you may be thinking, well, how could I lean into joy when I'm dealing with a diagnosis or when I have just lost my job or when I am having struggles in my marriage or whatever the problem might be. This is when we really have to get to work. Those moments when things are difficult and there isn't joy in sight, that's when we have to do our best to lean into the next best feeling vibration. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael and I make these videos because in my first business, I was making 300 bucks a month. I quit on my business partner and the thing that saved me was studying the stories of super successful entrepreneurs. So I hope that this story today helps give you the motivation you need because I still need it to myself. So today, let's live your best believe life and learn the amazing power of positive thinking. Enjoy. Rule number two is overcome negativity with Tom Bilyeu. My brain somehow finds ways to trick me and keep me unmotivated and negative all the time. It's really depressing to be like this and stuck in a rut. If you could help me overcome this curse of negativity, I truly appreciate it. And thanks a million for your efforts. All right, homie, when I say I have the silver bullet for this one, this, this is the magic genius answer that people were looking for on the other one. Here it goes. You do not need to think that you are anything special. It is absolutely okay for you to be hopelessly average. Why? To me, the most powerful thing that you could believe about yourself is that you're the average human. Now, why? I actually think it is less powerful for you to think that you are above average because to think that you are above average means that you are valuing yourself for being better than people. It's a super vulnerable position to be in because you will inevitably meet people who are better than you. And what do you do with your ego then? Then it's really crushing. You thought you were the man and now you encounter somebody that's better than you. They slap you around, they outperform you, they dunk on you, whatever. And now, whoa, like you've got to rebuild and claw your way back versus saying the following. The average human is the ultimate adaptation machine. As a species, humans have chosen to respond to cultural and environmental cues. So we do not come pre-programmed like a horse that comes out of the womb, 10 minutes later, it's ready to rock and roll. It's running around doing all the things that a horse can do. A human, on the other hand, has this huge period of development after birth where we cannot take care of ourselves. We can't walk, can't hold our own head up. We shit in our pants. It's crazy. But what that does is it allows us to drink in this, the environment that we're born into and adapt. So the average human is the ultimate adaptation machine. Therefore, being the average human means you're a learner. That's it. You're not exceptional. So you, you're not putting any of your psychology, your um, self-worth, your pride into being better than somebody else. It all comes down to valuing yourself for being the learner. So, hey, cool. You wasted a bunch of time at school. No reason to hide from that. It was a waste. We're not going to repeat the mistake, but we learn. So you've got the self-awareness to see that it was a mistake. Now it's just like, what do you want to do? What do you want to get great at? Because if you apply yourself, even if you're not good yet, you can get good. How do I know that? Because you're the average human. And the average human is the ultimate adaptation machine. This is all about disciplined focused energy into acquiring a skill set. It's what I call the only belief that matters. When you believe the time and energy directed at something through deliberate practice will actually make you better at that thing. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, I can get good at anything if I apply myself. And now all of a sudden, your behaviors align with your belief. That's why that belief matters so much. Because if you don't think you can get better at something, then why would you apply any time and energy to it? And if you don't apply time and energy to it, then you really won't get any better. 
So it becomes this loop of, well, I believe I can get better. Therefore, I try. Therefore, I actually get better. Therefore, I try harder. And you get in this virtuous cycle. This is hugely important. That is one of those things that will govern the rest of your life. You value yourself for learning, getting better at something, and applying yourself. Everything else will take care of itself because you just keep applying yourself. Don't make excuses. Don't BS yourself. If you waste the time, you waste the time. Don't spend your time beating yourself up over it because we only do and believe that which moves us towards our goals, right? We talked about that earlier. So we're going to do and believe that which moves us towards our goal. And in this case, that is the belief that we can get good at anything. Now, there's an incredible quote. I love this quote so much. You can't make a racehorse out of a pig, but you can make a really fast pig. Your life can be the answer to what does a fast pig look like. That is certainly what my life is. All the success that I've had in my life is not because I was gifted at any one thing. When I left for college, my mother quietly assumed I was going to fail. My best friend assumed I was going to marshmallow my way through life. When I asked my father-in-law for his blessing to marry his daughter, he said no. And yet I went on to be successful, to earn my father-in-law's respect, um, not because they misidentified me, because they didn't, they were right, but because I developed drive. I got the only belief that mattered. And I finally realized that humans are meant to grow and get better at something. And I just have to apply myself. And the same is true for you. Decide what you want to get good at and go after it with everything you've got. Rule number three is fulfill your emotional needs with Mel Robbins. Do you know what your core emotional needs are? There are three of them. I want you to go in the comments. What do you think your three core emotional needs are as a human being? These are the core emotional needs that every human being needs in order to feel safe, in order to feel connected to themselves, in order to feel loved. What are those core needs, everybody? I'd like you to just write them in the comments, okay? Yep, one's safety, one's love. These are great. What else, What are your needs? Your core emotional needs. I see longing. I see love. These are excellent, excellent responses, everybody. Human connection, love, acceptance. Yep, yep, trust, honesty. What are your core? There they are. I see Felicia's nailed it. To be seen, to be heard, And to be, she says validated, but it can be validated, accepted, or celebrated for the unique individual that you are. So to be seen, to be heard, and to be celebrated and accepted for the unique individual that you are and the unique contribution that you have. When you feel seen, when you feel heard, and when you feel celebrated or accepted, for the contribution that you make as an individual, unique individual. You feel safe, you feel like you belong, and at your core, you feel loved. When you don't feel seen, you feel invisible in life. When you don't feel heard, you're gonna feel misunderstood. And when you don't feel like you are accepted or validated, you feel completely rejected and disconnected. You feel like you are unworthy or unloved. And so again, we're gonna talk about your need to be seen, to be heard and to be accepted and celebrated. You need this at work, you need this at home, you need this in your relationships, your friendships, your romantic relationships, your family. And you know, if you just reflect In your life, where do you feel seen, heard, and celebrated? Where in your life do you feel that way? Or is there a person in your life that makes you feel that way? Hopefully, you are saying that you make yourself feel seen, heard, and celebrated. But is there somebody else in your life that makes you feel that way? It could be a caregiver. It could be somebody that you're in a romantic relationship with. It could be a mentor. It could be a friend. It could be your pet, right? Like, I mean, 
I think one of the reasons why we all love our cats and our dogs so much is because there's such unconditional love. You walk in the door, they come running right at you. And so you feel seen and you feel celebrated, right? And when they're right there with you, or you know, have you ever noticed how when you get really upset and you start crying, what do your animals do? Oh my God, they hear you and they come right on over. And I, those responses that are so innate when it comes to your pets, everybody, they're fulfilling your emotional needs. That's why you feel so safe and connected and loved by your pets because you feel seen by them, you feel heard by them and you feel celebrated and loved by them. And I do see people saying, I feel that way about my daughter, my mom, a mentor of mine. These core values when they're missing from your life of being seen, heard, celebrated and accepted this is what leads you to feeling stuck and disconnected and unfulfilled. And the good news is when you realize that these core fundamental needs truly dictate how you feel and experience your life, now you've got the access point to be able to change how you're experiencing your life by focusing on your core fundamental needs and making sure that they are met. All right. You need these three fundamental emotional needs in order to thrive. You know, they talk about this in Psychology 101. Uh, it's called Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. And here's the background. You have basic needs that are fundamental to your fulfillment, your happiness, and your survival. You know you need water, food, oxygen, shelter, and sleep, right? Because if you don't have water or food or oxygen or shelter or you get enough sleep, guess what? You die. That's how fundamental these core needs are. You also know that you need friendship or else you're going to feel lonely. And research shows that people die from loneliness too. It's a huge killer. You may also know that you have a fundamental need to grow because if you're not growing and learning as a person, you start to feel stuck in your life. But what you may not know is that you do have these core fundamental emotional needs to be seen, to be heard, to be loved for the unique individual that you are. And when these emotional needs are not met, it's not only a form of neglect, but you will feel unloved, invisible and unfulfilled. And see, I believe that's how we all got so critical of ourselves in the first place. And it's why we're twisting ourselves in knots ever since. That at some point in your childhood, those core fundamental needs stopped being fulfilled. You started feeling invisible. You started feeling disconnected. You started feeling like you didn't belong. And as we talked about in yesterday's video, this is all covered in chapter four of the High Five Habit, that you then turned that, that feeling against yourself and you started to go, well, there must be something wrong with me. There must be something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. It was that your three fundamental emotional needs were not being fulfilled by the adults around you. That's all that was wrong. So you can change this, by the way, for yourself. Because what's missing, if you're not fulfilled in life, is a deeper connection to yourself because you've probably been so busy running from one thing to the next that you can't even grasp right now how big of a shift it's gonna create when you start each morning by simply seeing, hearing, and honoring yourself. And one of the reasons why I love all the research uh, around adding a simple high five in the mirror to your morning routine is that it fulfills your deepest emotional needs as a human being, this one action of just high-fiving yourself in the mirror, add it to your morning routine. How many of you have added a high five to your morning routine and you're stunned by how much it's changing the way that you see yourself, the way that you treat yourself? Um, because as you've learned, these three emotional needs were probably never met during your childhood and you haven't been given the tools until right now to be thinking about this and to start fulfilling these emotional needs as an adult. And you know, the reason why you feel invisible at work or you feel outside of your friend group or you feel disconnected in your relationships as an adult, not to mention the relationship you have with yourself is because there's something missing. And what's missing is a deeper sense that you actually matter. What's missing is the sense that you are being seen and heard and appreciated. 
This is critical. It's so critical. If you were to wake up and you had a feeling of being connected to yourself and you felt seen in your life and you felt appreciated in your life and you felt heard in your life, that would absolutely change how you go through life. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free there's a link in the description below go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business i'll see you there rule number four is have a positive attitude with marie forleo if you ever feel like you're missing out on some big secret to success that everybody else knows but you you are gonna want to watch this one let me tell you all right, so a little story here. A few years back, I was driving to a lunch meeting in LA and there was a lot of traffic as usual and not too much parking on the street. So I pulled into a garage with a valet. Now, what happened next was so unexpected. I opened the door to hand over my keys and I got blasted by this guy <laughs> with unconditional love. <laughs> I gotta tell you, this guy's energy was so off the charts. He was Latino, probably like late 60s, and he was this total powerhouse of joy. The way he greeted me was like he was picking up some lifelong friend at the airport, and he gently just helped me out of my car. He asked me about my day, and get this, he was genuinely interested in the answer. And then he flashed this smile at me that was brighter than the California sun. I'm not kidding. This man was one of the most enthusiastic souls that I have ever met in my life. Now, one of the things that struck me was that this was the valet guy. And as somebody who's worked in the service industry for years, I know that these kind of jobs, I mean, they can be challenging. You're often dealing with a lot of cranky people. You're probably not making that much money. And honestly, it can feel thankless at times. But this guy, oh my goodness, the energy that he brought to his work, it was like he was this happy king and he was welcoming you into his palace. And the reason the reason I wanted to share this story is because it is such a potent reminder of one of the most underrated secrets to success there is. It is not just about what you do, it's about how you do it. You see, behavior alone is not enough. The energy, the soul, the spirit that you infuse into your actions, it matters. And I mean, this applies to your work. It applies to your relationships. It applies to everything. You know, as Jim Carrey said, the effect you have on others is the most valuable currency there is. And I mean, you know this to be true, right? There's such a huge difference between someone who just shows up and they kind of go through the motions and maybe even worse, they're like a walking complaint. I mean, that creates a completely different result than somebody who shows up and like they're full of warmth and enthusiasm. Like they actually want to be there. And there are three reasons that I feel why getting this is so, so important. Number one, your attitude is contagious. You know, we human beings, we have mirror neurons in our brains that make our emotions catchable, meaning your joy, your enthusiasm, all that stuff, it rubs off on people around you. And so does a totally crappy attitude. Kind of like germs. Oh my God, somebody got joy all over me. Oh, sorry, Marie, that was me. You know what, little joy never hurt anybody. So take responsibility for the energy you're putting out there, all right? Number two, this moment makes your future moment. So here's what this means. How you do what you do impacts how people respond to you and very often the results that you get. So in the case of my very sweet valet, I was so grateful for his energy that I gave him a very big tip, like probably three times the standard amount. And let's be honest, that's how all of us can build momentum in this life, by wowing other people and doing that with your genuine heart and your genuine caring and your attention to detail. 
And number three, you can make a difference in this world no matter what you do for a living. And really, really hear that. You know, I get so many questions from people saying, gosh, I feel like what I do just isn't that important. Or Marie, you know what? I want to find a way to make a bigger impact in the world. What should I do? This is what you should do. Don't just focus on what you're doing. Give attention to how you're doing it because you have countless opportunities every single day to change real people's lives simply by choosing to. Start infusing everything you do with some genuine love and enthusiasm and your humanity and just watch the difference that it makes both for you and for everybody around you. Rule number five is get motivated with Vanessa Van Edwards. According to the research, the best motivator for helping people achieve their goals is see progress. In his New York Times bestselling book, Drive, The Surprising Truth About What Motivates Us, Daniel Pink pulls apart four decades of scientific research on human motivation. Let's dive into what the science says about how to motivate yourself and others. Small wins self-motivate. We used to think financial incentives were the best kind of motivation. Pink argues that this is outdated. The deep human need to direct our own lives. Progress is what we should champion over rewards. Whether you're talking to your colleague, your spouse, or trying to motivate yourself, highlight progress. Here's how. When sitting down to make your to-do list every day, start with what you've already done yesterday up top. Write what you have completed in the last 24 hours, and then what you want to complete in the next 24 hours. Make a little ceremony of checking off the progress you've already made before doing more. Make scoreboards for yourself and your team so you can see how far you've come in the middle of a big project. This works for home projects, work projects, and passion projects. When speaking with teammates, instead of saying what they have to do next, talk about what they did already first. When giving a compliment, highlight specific tasks they already achieved. Don't talk about how much they have left. Talk about how far they've come. Self-motivating talk. What does it sound like in your head? Sometimes I wish I could hop into someone's head just to hear what they are thinking. Our thoughts are secret, and it's a good thing, too. We're far more brutal in our own minds than in reality. The problem is our thoughts matter. Here are the major questions I have for you. When you talk to yourself, are you nice, mean, harsh, sweet? Do your thoughts match your actions? Would you be okay broadcasting your thoughts? The first step to getting motivated is understanding how your thoughts are tied to your actions and if your self-talk is holding you back. The brain believes what you tell it most. I recently picked up the book, What to Say When You Talk to Yourself by Shad Helmstetter. Dr. Helmstetter argues that we are programmed by our thoughts. Specifically, he calls out something called our self-truths. Self-truths are the ideas we tell ourselves, the beliefs we carry around whether they are true or not. Sometimes we learn self-truths from life experiences. Other times, we pick them up from those around us. We believe what we are told by parents, bosses, and teachers, especially if the same idea has been told to us over and over again. For example, I believe I had no chance to be good at math. From a young age, I was told it wouldn't come naturally to me or that math will be your worst subject. And sometimes even math is hard for girls. And guess what? It was and is. I wonder what would have happened if I had been told the opposite. Here's some other common negative self-truths I hear people say all the time. I am horrible at remembering faces. I have terrible luck. I'm awful with people. I'm not creative. Things never work out for me. I'm just not the type of person who. Do any of these sound familiar? I want to take a moment and have you think about some of your self-truths. What are some limiting beliefs you say to yourself? Fill in the blank. I'm not good at. I always. I never. I'm just not the type of person who. I'm not very good at. If it was hard to fill these in or you had positive thoughts, amazing! Your self-truths serve you. If you had negative thoughts pop into your brain immediately, then we have some work to do. These kinds of thoughts kill motivation before you can even get started. If you're warming up your brain with these kinds of thoughts, there is no way you can work or be productive as your best self. Motivation buzzkills. 
The other kind of self-talk can come up around certain people or in specific situations. I call these motivation buzzkills. We have no chance of motivating ourselves if we constantly are putting ourselves down. For example, I feel very out of place in nightclubs and loud bars. My self-talk sounds something like, I am so uncool, or I don't belong here. This is probably a learned self-truth. I had a few bad experiences early on, and now I just can't shake them. A friend of mine tends to chastise herself whenever she is around her mother. Before driving over to her parents' house for dinner, she'll sit in the car and agonize, I'm always so late, I never have my life together. And the sad thing is her mom says the same exact thing the moment she walks in the door. Honey, you're always late, you have to be more organized, you have to get your life together. This is a taught self-truth that is turned into a motivation buzzkill. Every time she goes over to see her mom, she is constantly self-doubting, which makes her more disorganized and more late. Her mom reaffirms the exact behavior and she holds on to it. Where do you put yourself down? Is it at work? With your boss? Around your parents? With your friends? With your productivity? At school? With technology? With your health? Identify the areas where you have the least motivation and the most negative self-truths. Limiting wishes. Sometimes self-truths come in the form of limiting wishes. Limiting wishes, a future state that we hope will solve all of the problems from our current lacking self. For example, one woman came into our lab and told us that the reason she can't make friends is because of her horrible nose. I look like a toucan, she said. When I'm talking to people, I know all they're thinking about is my nose. As soon as I get it fixed, it will be so much easier to meet people. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever not been able to talk to someone because you didn't like their nose? No, absolutely not. We tried explaining this to her in every possible way. We even had people watch videos of her and rate her on a variety of personality traits. Not one single person mentioned her nose. However, she was convinced of this limiting wish. Her limiting wish was, if only my nose was smaller, I would be able to make friends. Here are some other common limiting wishes. If only I was thinner. If only I was taller. If only I was richer. If only I was funnier. If only I was smarter. If only I had got that promotion. If only I could move to that city. If only I could find a significant other. If only I was older. If only I was younger. Do you have any limiting wishes? Any desires that are holding you hostage? Fill in the blank. If only I was... I wish I... Everything would be better if I... Limiting wishes make motivation incredibly difficult because they are barriers to productivity. Bottom line, if you think you need to change something, do something, or have something before you can get motivated, then it will be almost impossible for you to be productive. It's time to banish those limiting wishes and get to action right now. Changing self-talk. Dr. Helmsetter says you can change your self-talk. First, you have to admit you have some negative self-truths. We just did that. Then you need to recognize the need to change. Did you start this video saying things like, I need to, or I should. Great, you are watching this video for a reason, so clearly you know you want more motivation. Hopefully, this is where you are right now. The first half of this video was getting you to think about changing some of your negative self-truths and limiting wishes. Now we have to decide what change to make. Change your internal voice. What does your internal voice sound like? For just a moment, think about the voice in your head. You know, the one that comments on your actions or makes little observations about the world around you. Does that voice sound like the voice you use in real life? Over the last few years, I have talked to people about their own self-talk. And more often than not, I hear them mention how mean the voice in their head is and how that often they want to talk to themselves in a much nicer way than they do. Would you speak to someone else the same way you speak to yourself? Take a look at this spectrum. When you talk to yourself, where do you fall? I'll be honest, I am extremely critical of myself. When I don't get something right, I internally berate myself. If I mess up with something or have a bad workout day, I internally chastise my laziness and lack of willpower. I actually had no idea I was doing this until I began to write down some of my internal thoughts. 
action step for you. For the next seven days, carry around a journal or create a note in your phone and write down every single internal thought that goes through your mind about yourself. You don't have to write down all of your thoughts, just the thoughts that are assessment-based. When you judge yourself, both positively and negatively, you want to write down what you think about how you do your tasks and activities. Re-examine. Examine the kinds of thoughts you have on a daily basis. See any patterns? How many positive thoughts did you have versus negative ones? I want you to take out a sheet of paper and draw three columns. In the first one, write down all of your limiting belief patterns. These are your motivation killers. What thoughts are counterproductive to you being your best self or working at optimal levels? It might look like this. It seems silly, but sometimes we've been thinking something for so long that we have forgotten what made us believe it in the first place, and we certainly no longer challenge it. I want you to go through your self-truth list and write down its opposite in a column called Opposite. It should look like this. This is the hard part. I want you to write down all of the reasons why the opposite is true. Sometimes this means finding learning experiences from hard memories. The goal here is to systematically disassemble all of your self-truths that are not serving you by looking for evidence. Your choice to self-motivate. Now you have a choice. You can live automatically by default, or you can live purposefully with challenges and hard truths. I do not believe ignorance is bliss. I think truly living is embracing truth about yourself, about the people around you, about how we work. But only you can decide to do this. If you want to try purposeful self-talk, all you have to do is complete the three steps above when you begin to be self-critical. I can't do this all the time, but it's what I try to do most of the time. This is how I've overcome a lot of my social anxiety. When I find myself awkward in a social setting, I go through the same three steps from above. For example, a common negative self-truth I say is, I don't belong. The opposite is, I belong. Evidence, I'm here to build my business. I already spoke to two new people. I love learning about people. This is a great new experience. And so it goes. It's a slow process, but it does help me challenge my limiting beliefs. It's not easy. It doesn't happen all the time, but it's exactly what it sounds like in my head. You have a choice to begin to slowly change your self-talk and remove those motivation buzzkills. Motivation Mantra we all need rituals, routines, and habits to get ourselves motivated. Using the framework above, come up with a motivation mantra for all of your common limiting self-beliefs. For example, if you tell yourself, I'm so dumb, the opposite would be, I'm talented. The evidence is that I have this great job, I have done this task before, and my team is counting on me. You can do this. Tackle those limiting self-truths one at a time. I am rooting for you. Rule number six is eliminate self-doubt with Russell Brand. What are some ways to eliminate that self-doubt and gain confidence? Well, self-doubt can be critical, Lewis, because it can be a component of awareness. I feel that the answer must always be the embarkation on a spiritual life because uh, it's difficult, isn't it, in this world of personal development that we find ourselves in, for us not to take on the tropes and objectives of a culture that I think at this point we need to be querying, querying and looking to move away from. We've all been deeply inculcated to believe that the pursuit of happiness is contingent upon the attainment of of our petty, trivial desires. But real <laughs> happiness is contingent on being free from those petty, trivial mm -hmm. desires. As long as I'm a prisoner to that, like, you know, see if someone's like that, that doesn't know, you know, don't, can't pluck up the confidence to ask someone out or can't pluck up the confidence to pursue their dream or whatever. For me, I don't feel like it's my job to operate at that, that that intersection, at the intersection of, well, come on, believe in yourself. You're as good as anyone else. You'll never know unless you try. You know, I don't think that's my job. My job is like, why do you think you want this? What do you think it's mm. going to do for you? What do you want really? What do you really want? What do you really want? What is it you are looking for? You know, 
A friend of mine observed once that in the 1980s, the prominent sort of entrepreneurs were all about zipping about on speedboats and whooshing through the skies in hot air balloons, intrepid, bold adventurers. The very same tycoons now are all about greenness and ecology and safety and helping, responding to the trends that define a time, this time now of apparent fragility. I think our job is to look for some truth beneath culture, that culture in many cases is not our friend. Culture is here to chain us to systems of tyranny, subtle tyranny. What is freedom really if it is only freedom to operate within certain parameters? It isn't freedom at all. I'm not saying I wouldn't rather be a person who is affluent in California than a person that's sort of poor in, I don't know, Tehran or Senegal or, you know, I'm not be poor anywhere, frankly. It's pretty grim to be poor in anywhere in the world. I've been poor in places before. But I don't feel like our job is to train people to bend themselves into a shape where they can succeed within these systems. I think our job is to train people so that they learn to challenge these systems, to create fairer systems that are not solely mm -hmm. built upon the fulfillment of individual goals. My friend Adam Curtis, the great filmmaker and genius says the genie is out of the bottle now on individualism it's never going back in you're never going to be able to tell people hey why don't you forget your own identity you're just a member of a community of a collective of a parish you know that's not going to happen now everyone live nothing is as real to you or i as our own thoughts as our own dreams as our own but that's just the way it is now but perhaps through this we can attain some meaning and if i refer back even to my own suggestions serve the thing you are pursuing you know if it's like you really want to go out of a a boy or a girl why are you looking to serve them or do you think they're going to somehow solve or absolve you you see them as some salve or if you're after some dream why is it because you don't feel like you're good enough or you're worthy you know one of my friends said like to me that you're like someone who's been up to the all you can eat buffet table stuffed your face full of everything and then going to everyone else you don't need this stuff <laughs> you don't need it <laughs> this, this yeah. cake won't work for you but you've done you know, it yeah. but, <laughs> but I have had this experience so you know you know, anyone that's saying well that's easy for you to say then yeah god damn it they're right well it wasn't that easy to get here let me tell you mm -hmm. and like so but what I would say is this is, I would, say, I would say this, that you are beautiful, that you are mm. enough, that you deserve to feel content and happy, but you have to be willing to surrender everything. You have to be willing to surrender everything. You have to be willing to accept that what you think you should get might not be right. Where did it come from, that idea? Where did that idea that, you know, because if you are meant to be a world-class athlete, if you get on and do, you know what I mean, do the Tony Robbins version of get on and do the work, don't let anything stand in your way, believe in it, be willing to suffer, have the discipline, ha make the sacrifices, then that's all sort of cool. But if the only reason you're becoming a world-class athlete is because your father told you you're not good enough and that you're cheap and you ain't no kind of a man mm -hmm. or woman or whatever, then pff, that you're going to need to deal with that shit. Otherwise, you're going to end up strung up in a hotel room one way or another, you know, because it doesn't like, you know, like you and I both know enough people Like I've having experienced the type of celebrity that I experienced. I've met people that, as I'm sure you have, that are in at the apex, the zenith. They have mm -hmm. enjoyed it. They have been to Kubla Khan. They've had it. They're in there drowning in riches and drowning indeed because mm. it's not real. Mm. It's not real. Never lose sight of the fact that we are in limitless space in every direction. Never lose sight of the fact that in the subparticular world, the rules of physics as we previously understood them are falling apart. Never lose sight of the fact that our senses are limited and we can only only see 0.63% of the electromagnetic range, that we are operating essentially in darkness, that the neural activity that we experience that constitutes our reality is only a tiny percentage of the potential of our own brain, let alone the potential brain of God. Wouldn't it be a coincidence mm. if we were issued with all of the senses necessary to experience total reality? Isn't it more likely that we think of reality as just being the circumference of our sensual world? So there are limitless experiences as yet 
it unheard and many, uh, 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 unhad, and many of them lay in the realm of mystery. Engage mm. with the mystery, meditate, pursue these spiritual disciplines. Don't rely entirely on the material path. This is not like you know, neglect the body or hate the body. Love the body. We are in this material world. We are God made flesh. We are having this experience in bodies, but. I don't think you can take what this culture is offering you as a solution and think that it will be a solution. You'll be disappointed. The map is not the territory. The map is not the territory. When you get there, it's not like that. It's not like that. So you start where you are. Start with you now. And rule number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is take control of your mind with Brian Tracy. Many years ago, when Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, who was a colleague of mine while he was still alive, wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. It's still one of the most popular books on personal success and personal development ever written. And his basic message was, is if you think in a positive way, you'll have positive results and you'll be happy most of the time. So how do you use the power of positive thinking? Well, they did a study at the University of Pennsylvania. It was funded by some of the biggest companies in America, and over a 22-year period, they interviewed more than 350,000 people like you and I, and asked them a lot of questions about their lives and their attitudes and so on. And one of the questions they asked them is, what do you think about most of the time? Then they conducted a series of experiments, is they would have graduate students who were working on their papers in psychology or sociology phone these people once a week at random during the week and just say, what are you thinking about right now? And they'd write it down. And the next week they'd call them on a different day at a different time. This is all prearranged that they would be expecting the call sometime. And what are you thinking about right now? And they'd write it down. Then they began to sort these groups out in terms of deciles, which is 10%. The bottom 10%, the next 10%, all the way up to the top 10%. And they noticed that people in the top 10% thought very differently from people in the bottom 80%. What do top people think about most of the time? Can you guess? The answer was so simple, it was amazing. They think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. They think about their goals and they think about their priorities and they think about their actions and activities each day. They think about the number of people they need to call on and the number of proposals they need to put together and the number of uh, things they need to read and to study. They're always thinking about what they want. And when you think about what you want, it makes you happy. It makes you positive. It makes you feel in control of your whole life. And then they think about how to get it. So in my seminars, I'll say that the most important word for leadership and success is the word how. Whenever you have a goal, the only question you ask is, how can I achieve this goal? If you have a problem, how can I solve this problem? If you have an obstacle, how can I overcome the obstacle? Top people think about what they want and how to get it most of the time. And as a result, they're thinking about their goal and they're thinking about the actions that they can take every single minute of every day to move faster toward achieving that goal. Earl Nightingale once said that happiness is the progressive step-by-step realization of a worthy ideal or goal. When you feel yourself moving step by step each hour, each day toward achieving something that's important to you, you feel positive and happy most of the time. By the way, do you know what unsuccessful people think about most of the time? They think about what they don't want, the things that make them angry or sad, usually past events that they can't change, and they think about who's to blame for all their problems. So whenever you see people talking and complaining about things that they can't change, things in their life uh, that are their their responsibility, and then blaming others for their problems, you know you're dealing with a negative, unhappy person with a very limited future and a very unhappy present. So the way you take control of your mind, like grabbing the wheel of a vehicle, is start to think about what you want and how to get it all day long. And you automatically become positive and start to feel in complete control of your life. I was born in Belarus in the former Soviet Union. Uh, I came to the US when I was three. We lived a very humble beginning. As you can imagine, the economy wasn't super great. We didn't speak English. We had 100 bucks. Uh, I lived with seven family members in a studio apartment in Queens. Um, so it was super humble. As you, and you know, obviously, my parents are very much my heroes. Uh, one, because my mom is 
the greatest parent of all time, and two, because my dad worked his face off, and even though I slept under the same roof literally every day of my life with my dad in the first 14 years of my life, I literally never saw him, because he left at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m., and he came home at 10 p.m., and he worked seven days a week. Um, How many people here are immigrants or children of immigrants? Raise your hands. Awesome, so this group that just raised their hands, they know that Immigrants in America have absolutely figured out one of the core secrets, which is, you know, work your face off and don't buy dumb shit. <laughs> and so that's kind of what my family did for seven or eight years. You know, we, my dad wasn't making that much money, but a funny thing happens when you buy nothing but food at the lowest possible price. And uh, save, 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 save. And very quickly, only six years after coming to America with 100 bucks, my dad was able to buy a small liquor store in New Jersey. We moved to New Jersey. That is where my entrepreneurial career began. Uh, when I was six, I had a five lemonade stand franchise. I uh, manipulated my friends into standing behind the lemonade all day, and that is when I became obsessed with attention, and this is really interesting, as you can see up here, I day trade attention, culture, and build businesses. At six years old, I would spend my summer days literally walking up and down the streets of New Jersey, sitting down on the curb, watching cars drive by so that I could figure out which tree or post was better for me to put a sign that said lemonade a quarter. That is DNA. That's like somebody singing, that's like somebody throwing a pitch, really, like, that is just pure DNA. I didn't read a Seth Godin book or go to Harvard Business School to figure out that attention was the number one asset. The one thing that combines every person here, from the cameramen back there who are producing, to the industry that is in this room, to me, to Mickey, to anybody else that sneaked in, the one thing that fundamentally connects all of us is before you tell me how great your product and service is, you need my attention so that I listen. I am obsessed with attention. I am obsessed with this device because it has the attention. I am unemotional if it's ruining the kids and they don't know how to engage or that you are sad that people go out to dinner and don't talk to each other. Technology does not care about your feelings. And so I, as a human, may have some opinions about parenthood and and society and privacy as a human, but as a businessman, I am unemotional and not romantic. All I do is follow where the attention is and I figure out how to storytell in there to create the action that I desire. I was aware at that moment how many times in my life I've, I've woken up like not sure I think it started happening for me uh, years ago, like like probably around 12 or 13. I didn't know what to do every day. What's, what's today going to bring? I th- maybe it's after watching so much TV and eating so much sugar. You know, I think our diets definitely have a lot to do with all that. But look, I want to give you something today about how to get out of the funk, the funky hunk dunk. When I, by the time I was 25, this thing went on from 12 to 25. At 25 years old, I was in so much depression every day. I was using drugs, alcohol. I was self-medicating constantly, making bad decisions. I lived in a 275, uh, I mean, I just remember how much it was. It was $275 a month, and every other month I couldn't make the bill, the payment. I was late. Today, I live in this joint right here. I live up on the 33rd floor of this place. And completely different life today than I had then. 25, I went to a treatment center for 20, 28 days for drug addiction. I was using drugs every day, hated it. Let me tell you something worse than drugs is how you feel about yourself. I hated myself every time I did a drug. Every time I smoked weed, every time, every time I did any drug, the moment I put the pill in my mouth, the weed to my mouth, something in my nose, I, I hated myself. I never felt good about using drugs. And so by the time I was 25, I had been using drugs for 10 years, but my problems started before that. My problems didn't start with the drugs, it started with my inability to manage 
this light grade chronic depression. This, for lack of better words, this this idea that I wasn't good enough. This idea that that um, that um, I didn't love myself. You know that that you know my my mom gave my mom quit on me. My mom told me, "Hey, don't come around here anymore." My twin brother pretty much was done with me. My sisters both knew that I was in trouble and were like, oh my God, you know, we're gonna get a call on him today. The people I worked with, the principal at the high school I went to said I couldn't, couldn't win dog catcher in my 11th and 12th grade, told my mom that. My student, uh, my PE teacher said I would amount to nothing. I wrecked my car on my driver's ed test. I failed my driver's license test. I was fired from my first six jobs. Wouldn't leave the sixth one. Dude, I'm telling you, I was a loser. Loser, okay, I'm telling you, loser. And I didn't have to ask other people. Nobody had to tell me I was a loser. I knew I was a loser. So, look, if you've ever been there, I know there's people watching this right now. Maybe you don't even know who I am. You're like, who's this dude talking about himself, you know? I've come from that, where I was, bankrupt, spiritually, financially, physically. I weighed 134 pounds. That's 40 pounds less than I weigh today. I was broken every way possible. I didn't have any money. I was in debt. But worst, the worst thing, the worst of the worst of the worst was how I felt about myself. I got out of that treatment center and the counselor told me on the way out of the treatment center, uh, if you read my last book, Be Obsessed or Be Average, it was the first book that I really shared anything about my life. Of all seven of my books, that, that one gives you a, a kind of a look inside my life more than anything. And um, maybe what I'll do is in this, maybe what I'll do is I'll have my guys give you, give you a, 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 a chapter of that book free. And um, it's not what I came here to give you. I want to. Do, I do want to give you something, but maybe my guys could put a couple of different links in here for you. So <clears throat> I got out of that treatment center, and the counselor said to me, "I think his name was Philip. I don't remember the guy now. I hated his guts then. I still don't think much of him." He said to me, "Guy was really confused. He was more confused than I was." He said, "Now that I look back, he said to me. He said to me. He said, "Hey, if you leave here." If you leave here and you don't give up, you know, because when you're there, you spill your guts, you tell them everything. And I told them I wanted to be rich and famous and, and help people and write books and, you know, be known all over the world. And he says, if you don't give all those ideas, I think he called it grandiosity. If you don't give up all these grandiose ideas of changing the world, uh, being rich, being famous, if you don't change all those ideas, Dude, you'll never, ever, ever make it. You'll never stay, what do you call it? You'll never stay dry and sober. If I've got a friend in my life or a, or a you know, partner that I want to encourage to mm -hmm. come out of their place of despair into a better place, how do I effectively do that without overpowering them or stifling them or making them feel inadequate, which is sometimes the consequence of trying to change someone you love? Mm -hmm. Well, example's good. Mm -hmm. But then I would say, disabuse yourself of the notion that you know what is best for this person. You don't, not only do you not know, you actually don't want that responsibility for two reasons. Let's say they do what you say and something good happens to them. Well, whose victory is that? Yours or theirs? And if it's yours, did you just steal it? And then let's say they fail following your advice. Well, they pay the price for that. And you can skip away merrily and say, well, I should have spoke more carefully. It's like, you don't mess about with people's destiny. You do not know where they're headed. Now, having said that, you do what you're doing in this interview, in this podcast. You ask people questions, real questions, you know? Like, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm not doing so good today. Well, you know, what's up? What's going on? And you can't think, well, I'm going to ask questions to lead this person in a particular direction because that's the same game, the same instrumental game. You have to see what it is that you want to know. Like I see this when people ask me questions after my lectures, you know. 
Now, now and then, or during a Q&A, now and then people will get up and they'll ask a real question. It's part of the ongoing dialogue. Something struck them. They stand up. There's something they really want to know. It's an honest question. And that goes real well. But not infrequently, someone stands up with a little prepared speech that's packaged as a question. So I get this from Christian traditionalists fairly frequently. They get up and they ask me about my religious convictions, but really what they want to do is corner me into admitting that I should accept Jesus Christ as my savior and, and join a particular, let's say, uh, um, denomination. It's not a question. It's just a manipulation. And so your questions, like your statements, your questions should be honest. And if you ask people questions and you really listen, they will untangle themselves. And that's partly why people love to be attended to, you know? Like, if I meet people on the street, you know, I ask them their name. They're all usually flustered when they come up to me. They don't really want to interrupt me, and then they're flustered. And the first thing I do is shake their hand and ask them their name. And I listen, you know? I'm not that good at remembering names, but I listen to it. And, and they know how to say their name. And so it kind of settles them down. And then it sort of marks them out as a person against the background, eh? And then if I pay attention to them and listen, they will tell me something in like 10 seconds that I need to know. Because they, they have something to say, you know? And then if you listen, people tell you what they have to say. And then you get wise because you collect all that. And so you want to help someone. Well, first of all, you would decide that you're aiming towards help, right? And, and that you do that in the spirit of ignorance. This is what every good clinician learns, is I don't know where you're headed. I don't know what's wrong with you. This is a hard problem, man. It's like, what's your problem? I don't know what your problem is. So let's find that out first, and then let's find out one thing you can ask people. This is actually useful in an argument with someone you love. They're, they're upset with you. What are your preconditions for satisfaction? Now, I wouldn't state it like that. It's like, if I could give you what you wanted right now in the context of this argument, and I wasn't doing it in a manipulative way, what is it that I would have to say or do that would in principle satisfy you? And that's a hard question, you know? And the person might say, well, I think you should apologize and about this. And, you know, and, I, and then I will say, what words should I use? And they'll say, well, if you loved me, you'd know. And I would say, no, I'm stupid and ignorant, and I don't know what the right words are to satisfy you. So why don't you give me a hand with that, and I'll utter them inelegantly and awkwardly in a good faith demonstration of my commitment to peace. And that won't be so good, because maybe it would have been better if I came up with it myself, but maybe next time I can do slightly better. And that works. It, it requires the person who's after you to think through the question even of whether there's anything that could be said or done that would satisfy them. And if the answer to that is no, well, probably the relationship is over. But certainly, the person that they're accusing has been put in an absolutely impossible position. But usually, almost inevitably, if the person meditates on it for a bit, there is something that would satisfy them that can be negotiated as long as they're willing to give you the opportunity to do it, you know, stupidly and badly. So, listening, man. Jimmy Carr, I talked to Jimmy Carr two weeks ago, the famous comedian. Yeah, he was, he, he was real interesting. Um, he said comedy is the most dialogical of, of the entertainment forms. And I thought, well, what do you mean by that? Because you're just, talk it's a monologue, right? Now, I do monologues, but I pay attention to the audience, right? I'm always talking to individual people in the audience and watching their reactions and listening to the audience as a whole. So even though it's a lecture, let's say, or a talk, I'm watching the audience and responding. So we're in a kind of dance. Well, Carr pointed out that comedians, before they hit the road, and this is virtually in, invariably the case, they have their new routines, so they're... they're their corpus of potentially funny jokes. And then they do 200 shows in front of small audiences. And the audience either laughs or doesn't. And if you're listening, you collect all the jokes that people laugh at. If you do that 200 times, you have nothing but hilarious material. 
but you listened. And then you can go out on the road. And that was very interesting to me because humor is a mysterious phenomenon experientially and conceptually. And it's sort of precognitive and instinctual, but it's also extremely sophisticated. And there's an element of transcendence about it, right? Because you can laugh at yourself. And that's in some sense the highest form of humor. And so it's so interesting that we can criticize and elevate ourselves at the same time and that we find that intensely pleasurable. And so a good comedian collects ways to do that, shares them with the audience, and he's listening. And so if you want to help someone, the best way to help someone is not to give them advice, but to listen to them. Your challenges don't only make you stronger, they allow you to serve better. I think the default answer for a lot of people is that your challenges make you stronger. Your challenges will, you know, to grow muscle, you have to break, you have to break your muscle first. And all of these obstacles that they put in your way allow you to have a, a, a better life. They're making you stronger. They're making you more powerful. And that's all true. Yes. And the thing that helps me the most is just tying it back to service. Because I think, you know, humans are built to serve. You are built to serve. When you can connect the challenge that you're going through as something that's then going to inspire and help other people, at least for me, it always gives me a lot more strength and a lot more courage to do the thing that I need to do, as opposed to it just being about me getting stronger. I find a lot of times me getting stronger is not enough. It's not enough of a reason compared to it's going to help somebody else as well. So, you know, if that's you, hope this video helps you as well. So I think about when I was doing my tour 2019 and I broke my neck, it was one of the most challenging times in my life in that it's already hard enough. I'm already, you know, on the road or quarter of the year on the road, 90 straight days, me, Nina, my cameraman, Danny, and there were a lot of challenges in making that whole tour happen and new city every four days and all of the stuff that goes into, you know, it was my first ever tour. And then I broke my neck two thirds of the way through. So as if things weren't hard enough, now I break my neck. I can't drive anymore. Uh, I'm in insane amounts of pain. I have a concussion uh, and I, I'm still making videos. I, I struggled with the decision. This is a real decision. Do I, do I quit the tour or not? Do I quit the tour? Do I go home? There's still another month on the road. It's not just me. It's also Nina who has to do a lot more work now. She's got to drive this giant suburban across the country. Uh, Danny, the camera guy, has to do a lot more work. It, it, you know, it's, it's a lot of stress. I'm basically out of commission and all I could do is talk, which is great for speaking, but sucks for everything else. So what do we do? The thing that made me want to at least try to keep going, I didn't know that I would go for another month, but I thought, let's just do the next city. Let's just do the next city. Let's go to Kansas City. Kansas City was the next stop. Let's go to Kansas City and see what happens. What got me through it was thinking about somebody in the audience, thinking about one of you guys who was struggling with something physically. Up until that point, I had dealt with a lot of mental issues, mental issues, mindset issues, things like believing you're not good enough, lack of self-worth, you don't have a message to share, imposter syndrome, um, all, all of those things, right? Even here, we're filming, we're about to go through a car wash. Uh, we're, we're next, so we're probably going to get some crazy noise. We don't have to talk loud. I used to be so worried about that stuff that I wouldn't, I wouldn't film. Like, oh, I can't film going to a car wash, you know, the noise, whatever. Now I look at it as opportunities, like, let's go. Like, that's not a good enough reason. Maybe the video quality sucks. I, you know, I hope not. Um, maybe you can't hear me loud enough. I hope not. But, but not letting those things get in your way because that stuff happens all the time. You know, like that stuff happens all the time. And look, we're next. You guys can see it says it says car wash we're next depending on how long that guy ahead of us takes you might you might see it in this video i dealt with a lot of those mindset issues those lack of belief issues those worthiness issues and i i battled them and i've been through them and you know, have a few lessons to share <laughs> and over the years of me trialing and failing and you know 20 plus years of doing this my hope is to make the path a little bit easier for you so that you don't have to struggle as much as I did. The path can be a little bit sooner, a little bit faster, a little bit less painful, right? But I'd never been through anything really physical. Thank you. you know, I've, I've, I've broken my toe. <laughs> uh, I remember breaking my toe uh, and then going for a, a run 
and uh, I was doing an Instagram live at the time. It was like a, a, a light run, fast jog, and I like my toe was hurting so much, and I just kept powering through it. Then later, later realized I broke my toe, but that's not really anything major, right? You know, for somebody's going through something physical and major, it's like you broke your toe. Come on, it's not a big deal. And so I never felt like I could serve or push people who had a physical limitation had a physical kind of injury because I've never gone through it and I, and I don't feel right pushing people on things that I haven't experienced in some form myself right so here I am 2000, uh, 2019 now I break my neck now I have a concussion I'm in more pain than I've ever been in my life concussion if you haven't been through it is just devastating because it's not just a physical pain of not being able to move your body and you know neck and potential having um, spinal surgery, which is crazy scary, but also not being able to think clearly. For, for me, I, I value that a lot. Like I love thinking, you know, I love problem solving and not being able to think clearly and just be a vegetable on the couch all day was, was devastating. So getting through that and then deciding I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going. I'm going to at least try for the next stop in Kansas City. Why? Because if I can get through this, yes, it's a challenge that will teach me and make me stronger. And I have a lesson that I can learn from it. But if I can get through this, then hopefully it can serve as an inspiration for other people who are going through something physical as well. That it's not just a mindset issue, but they have physical limitations. You know, the first couple, the first night in the, in the hospital, I was, I, you know, a train wreck. Then I came home and... Uh, to our Airbnb, they let me out of the hospital. And I remember two specific moments. One, trying to get into the car. So we're at the hospital, I get discharged, I'm excited, go home, fresh air, oh my gosh, it's amazing. And I have this neck brace on, I can't move, I'm very low flexibility. And I'm now the passenger, I'm not allowed to drive because I can't turn my head. So Nina has to, Nina has to drive. And I'm in the parking lot of the hospital and I'm trying to get into the passenger side. I'm in the passenger seat right now in my car. I'm trying to get into the passenger side of the car and I can't. And it hurts too much. And I get to the point where I have one foot in the car and one foot out of the car. And it's a Suburban, so this is a giant step up to get in. And I remember being so, I was in so much pain that I couldn't go forward into the car. I didn't have the strength. And every time I lifted off, it, it killed everything in my body the whole like all my back up into my neck everything was in massive pain but i also couldn't get back down because that was hurting too much too so i was in i was stuck in this limbo of i can't go forward i can't go back nina's trying to you know push me up to get me in and then i remember just crying i'm in the parking lot of the oh we're going to the car wash i'm in the parking lot i'm gonna have to talk louder i'm in the parking lot of the hospital and i'm crying out of frustration and I can't remember the last time I was that frustrated that I just broke down and cried and I, I didn't know what to do next everything hurt I can't move forward I can't move backwards I'm just overwhelmed by pain and frustration and I'm crying in the parking lot of the hospital eventually Nina just pushes me in <laughs> one hand on each butt cheek and like in you go and I got in and it hurt but but then I was in and that was just an overwhelming moment. And then I remember that night, here we go, car wash. That night, uh, it was, I mean, I can't sleep. It's terrible. I've got, you know, neck brace on. I'm not used to sleeping with it. I'm in massive pain and it's, it's three in the morning and I have to go to the bathroom. And so I'm sitting, I, I can get myself to sit up. They taught me in the hospital how to push yourself from um, lying down to to sitting up. Ooh, look, here comes, look at the foam. Look at that, guys. How to go from lying down to sitting up without hurting yourself too much, like minimizing the pain as much as possible. So they taught me how to do that. So three in the morning, I have to go to the bathroom. I get up, uh, I, I push myself into the seating position. I'm starting to feel dizzy. I have a concussion, right? I'm starting to feel dizzy. I can't see anything because it's really dark and I'm worried that if I stand up, I might fall over. How I got the concussion was I fainted. I fainted on my head on the wall and then cracked my, my, the back of my neck open. 
I'm worried that if I stand up, I might faint and I might fall over again. And I, Nina's asleep next to me. Look at this. Were you sleeping on the floor? Nina's joining in. Nina, yeah. you no, you were on the bed. I was sleeping on the floor. Were you on the floor? Afraid that will wake you up. She was afraid she was gonna wake me up. I mean, bless Nina's heart. I mean, she had no sleep during this whole time too, right? So she's asleep. It's three in the morning, and I and I, I don't want to wake her up. One, because I feel bad for her because she hasn't slept at all. But also, feel, I feel helpless. I feel so helpless that I'm in all this pain and I can't even go. I can't even go to the bathroom by myself. Like I need help to go to the bathroom. I felt so helpless, and I said, "It's it's not worth it for me to get up and and potentially like if I fall, that's 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 no bueno, right? I'm back to the hospital probably if I fall." So I wake up Nina, and I mean it may not seem like a big deal, but it. It felt like a big deal. Like I felt just helpless. And so I had, you know, I woke her up. She helped me go to the bathroom. And you know, I, I did my business and went back to sleep. But those two moments in particular were the most painful moments of that whole experience. It's the best. Uh, and, and the thing that got me through it, the thing that gave me the motivation was that hopefully somebody else who's going through some kind of painful moment right now will be able to resonate with this and be inspired by this. Whether it's actually true or not, it was a story that I was telling myself. I told myself somebody's gonna be inspired by this. And I still made videos and my next round of videos, I couldn't do the whole thing, so Nina did some of it, I did some of it. Um, and I'm sitting there. I'm I'm now overweight because I'm uh, you know I haven't been able to work out. Um, I haven't been eating as clean as I was normally. Uh, I got a giant scab. If you look at some of those old videos, I had this huge scab on my forehead. Again, normally like oh my gosh, I got this giant scab on my. You might be worried about a little pimple. I got this giant scab coming down my forehead. I look like Harry Potter. The thing that gets me through it is other people who have some kind of issue, like they're having a bad hair day or a pimple on their face, might be inspired by this to go and take action. What, oh. Nina has a pimple on her, you wanna show everybody forehead. your pimple on your forehead? Yeah. <laughs> Again, whether it's true or not, it was a story that I was telling myself that somebody else is gonna be inspired by this and it's gonna allow them to go and do their thing. Um, now, fast forward, we make the videos, we release the videos. A lot of people were inspired by it. A lot of people did message me, DM me, email me, tell me in future interviews, you know, I was I was telling myself I couldn't do this because of X, because I had a headache. And here you are doing your videos with a concussion, giant scalp on your face, neck brace, in massive pain, breaking your neck, and I told myself, what well, I have no excuse. I'm gonna go do my thing because Evan did his thing. But again, whether it was true or not, the thing that got me to get through the challenge in a way that I'm proud of myself for was the connection to service. That it's not just here to make me stronger, which it did, it made me incredibly, like I can't believe I did that. That that guy is still in me, that I could go and do that again, hopefully don't break my neck again, but I could do that. It made me stronger, but even more valuable is me feeling like this is gonna mean something to somebody else. So whatever challenge you're going through, understand that yes, you know your purpose comes from your pain. This will make you a better person. But the thing that will help you get through it, at least from my experience, is connecting to somebody else. That there are tons of people out there who are also struggling with the same thing that you are struggling with right now. And when you get through it, your story will be an inspiration for them. Your journey through it will motivate them to have the courage to show up for their lives as well. And when you can actually connect it to service, I think everything is better. You are built to serve. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. 
you are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So as a special celebration, if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to become the person you want it to be with Jordan Peterson, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Don't make a plan that is what you should do. Make a plan that outlines a future so that you can sit back and say, look, if I had that future, then all the horrible things that are going to happen to me are going to be worthwhile. That's what you want.